We are just about live. Good to go from Ermit. Not yet connecting. Good to go. Hello, everyone. I'm back here again for at another um, interesting and 45 minutes full of insightful talk from Jim Evans. It's going to be completely different. We're not going to hear a full 45 minute talk from Jim. It's going to be an interactive a fireside chat. I'm super honored and we are grateful for having Jim Evans for doing this fireside chat. So, Jim, thank you so much for um, spending time with us. Um, how it's are you my feeling today? Pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm feeling I'm feeling good. Let's have some fun. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm in, I'm looking forward to to chatting with you, Manoj. Thanks, Jim. Likewise, um, folks. For those those of you who don't know, um, I'm Manoj. I'm with Lambda Test, um, leading the DevRel, and here we are with uh, Jim Evans. Jim, um, as I've been introing um, a couple of other speakers in the session, Jim also has been my very good friend for a very long time, um, especially around the Selenium community. Um, if I if I'm at this stage at Selenium community, um, I owe to two person, which is Simon and Jim Evans, for all their support and. Um, you know, uh, guidance throughout the uh, open source contributions and uh, Selenium project, especially, uh, and sort of the surrounding ecosystem. So thanks, Jim, for that. And I'm sure a lot of you will learn from uh, Jim's experience around open source because um, the Fireside Chat is completely all around Jim Evans' journey through open source with Selenium and its ecosystem, not just Selenium, uh, because it's, it's a life experience, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> you can say that. It certainly is. Right, right. Folks, so um, Jim Evans, he's, he's part of the technical leadership committee for uh, Selenium. He's been around more than 20, 25 years in the industry, uh, specializing in various different parts of um, the software um, quality, DevOps. Um, I think he's been known as, known as the uh, IE driver god, uh, who's been maintaining that code base for a very, very, very long time until it has been recently deprecated. Um, sad, sad from Microsoft for IE driver. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, um, Jim has been um, around 12, 15 years with Microsoft and he's been awarded an MVP for all his contributions. Um, getting an MVP from Microsoft is a great feat. Um, Jim, um, it's, it's great, great about it. And uh, very recently he's been, um, um, I think not very recently, he's been with Salesforce for a very long time right now and completing over a decade there as well. Um, so um, we will combine the Pfizer chat session will be all about his journey in open source as well as his professional experience combining. Uh, I'm sure we will learn a lot about, um, you know, the journey uh, from Jim. So with that, um, Jim, welcome again. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, your version of your introduction, and also touch us yeah. a bit on how you landed in open source. Sure. Well, that's, um, <clears throat> well, thereby hangs a tale. Uh, I'm Jim, uh, and I'm been around the open source world for uh, uh, quite some time. Um, and in fact, how I, how I got started with open source was um, I was working for a small company, uh, the name of which at the time was Numara Software. They've since been bought out uh, and are part of a larger software company now. But um, this was a long time ago. This was before the days of cloud infrastructure and before the days of, um, of, of everything being through uh, your browser, uh, the, the company had a, uh, you know, companies used to buy software and install it on premises, on servers. And the company, that, the, the product that I was working on was a client server based architecture. They had a thick client and a, uh, and a server uh, project for, for tracking um, uh, help desk requests and things. And I was, uh, one of the lead people in QA on that team uh, at the time. And we had spent a great deal of time doing uh, an automated uh, test suite for uh, the, the Windows-based client application. And it was a Windows app. Uh, and uh, the web was just starting to get going. And one of the features that the dev team added was the ability to do some things via a website that would connect to the server uh, side and, and, and allow you to do some things on the server side. And since we'd done all this work for the automation, for automated testing for the, for the, 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 the Windows client, uh, the next thing 
we wanted to do was do web automation. And we were a .NET shop. We were C-sharp. We, everything was done in C-sharp. And so we started looking around. We, we, all of our test automation was already in C-sharp. And we started to think about, well, so what are our opportunities or what are uh, uh, um, libraries do we have available to us to enable being able to automate the browser? And at the time, of course, IE6 was the state of the art. It was everywhere. It was ubiquitous. And um, so we started looking around. We didn't restrict ourselves to C Sharp. We looked around at other languages. Um, we even looked at Selenium at the time and rejected it because that was Selenium RC and we really didn't like the API. Uh, in all of our research, we found a, a project called Water, which is a Ruby-based library, um, which we loved the API, but we were a .NET shop. So there was no in-house expertise in Ruby and we really didn't have time to develop that expertise. So... We just so, so we kept looking and we found a port of the water API to C Sharp called Wadin. And it was designed to be used with Internet Explorer and it used the IE automation object model to, to do its work. And it was so we adopted that. And that was an open source library. And I think I may have contributed a couple of patches to fix some minor bugs with that originally. Um, and then they did, uh, and, and then we started to figure out well, we don't just support. Internet Explorer, we also support Firefox. And there was a, a, a Wadin feature that supported Firefox, but it did so through a mechanism that Mozilla killed between version three and version four of Firefox. And so we had to start looking around for a different um, alternative. And we, we uh, as I was looking around, I saw this project called uh, WebDriver, which was, its whole purpose was to be a, uh, a cross-browser automation system. Um, and in conjunction with that, we also had Water WebDriver, which Yari Bakken had adapted the Water API to use the WebDriver um, uh, uh, engine to drive the browser underneath. So there were these different pieces. There was this API that we liked. There was um, a cross-browser automation library that didn't have good .NET support yet, uh, and we and a combination of the two looked like to be the right approach. So I went to, to the WebDriver project, which at the time had just merged with the Selenium project. And this is where I met Simon Stewart for the first time. He was the project lead and said, hey, you know, you guys don't have, you have the stubs of a .NET language bindings for this project. Um, is anybody working on those? D does anybody have any, any, um, uh, you know, it, 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 do we have an ETA of when those are going to be complete or, or at least working towards something going? Because my plan was, here, I had a plan. My plan was that what I would do is I would first finish off the .NET language bindings to, to, to WebDriver, which then of course became Selenium. And then I would replicate what Yari did with in Ruby by having the water API uh, talk using talk to the browsers using WebDriver. I do the same thing in .NET and have Wad in talk to the talk to the browser using the .NET bindings for WebDriver. But the WebDriver language bindings had to be done first. So I spent a couple of months working on those and getting those into a shape that was reasonable uh, to use, and 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 started committing to open source at that point. And that, was, of course, was where my plan fell apart because uh, I, I, I did the first part. I completed the, 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 the web driver language bindings for .NET and then, uh, and, and then was going to go back and do the water integration, water-like integration, uh, but I never got around to that second part. So that is kind of how I started out in open source, and I've been doing that ever since. And that was 13, 14 years ago, 2008, 2009, thereabouts. And that's how I got started. Uh, Manoj is MIA. <laughs> yes. There we go. Apologies, network um, interceptions. Yep. It <laughs> cool, cool. Quite a journey, Jim. Uh, I heard most of it. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, we can carve out a complete career roadmap, and I'm sure we can publish a blog post around it, Jim. Thank <laughs> you so much for sharing that. Um, so, it's quite eventual that 
the dot net was not chosen by you it just happened to you isn't it yeah well it was it was one of those things where um we had a need and the pieces were out there they just weren't in a completed in a completed way yet and they just needed somebody to step in and sort of put the blocks together and add some glue in between to hold them all in together into into a cohesive whole and that's how i got started you know just finding something that we needed that somebody else had a had a you know at least a start at even though it wasn't finished and just going and trying to help out wonderful thanks jim so jim when when your stepping into of open source started where were you roughly at microsoft how how uh, was no, your... this was this was after i left see i left microsoft in 2004 and was working at numara software up until 2012 so this would have been 2008 2009 i was working for numara software which is a small small mm-hmm. uh software company here in the tampa bay area of florida in the us um Uh, and then of course I left there in 2012 and moved over to Salesforce and I've been at Salesforce ever since. I just celebrated 10 years this year with Salesforce. Congratulations. Now that you've spoken about your recent experience at Salesforce, um I I've seen some blog posts around open source work that you have been doing inside Salesforce. Mm-hmm. We all mm-hmm. know what you do outside with Selenium uh, for the community. Uh but there's been lots there's been lots and lots of been things cooking around cooking in in Salesforce especially around open source. Uh mm-hmm. is it called Utam? Could you please uh... That is yeah, that is that is our that's uh the project that I personally am working on here at Salesforce. Um uh there are uh, Salesforce really likes open source projects. They there are lots of things that Salesforce does that are open source. Uh the UI toolkit that's used by the Lightning uh experience at Salesforce, all of the UI in the Salesforce main application is based on a uh project called our Lightning web components and that is a completely open source um uh UI framework that, that was developed in house but also open sourced. Um Utam uh is our um UI test automation model uh which so internally we leverage uh, internal inside salesforce we leverage a lot of of uh UI of UI automated tests um written mostly with selenium and written mostly in java because a lot of the salesforce application is, the the server side is written in java and we have our own page object framework in house um but salesforce is not just an application it's also an application platform or a our development platform and it's an incredibly customizable platform and so we have lots of customers who are doing their own customizations even to completely reskinning the whole the whole app and um so in in that sense of course if they're doing development on the platform then they're going to want to do testing on that platform and one of the challenges with uh Salesforce as an application is that from a UI based automation standpoint it can be pretty complex and a challenge to automate so we looked to see if we could sort of figure out a way to give our customers who are doing testing of their customizations um a little bit of a helping hand a little bit of a head start on how to get started with automating uh their Salesforce application uh, the testing of it and so we uh we did a little market research and we realized that our developer base the people who are doing the developers um they don't they don't all use one language some of them use java some of them use javascript some of them use other languages um and when they want to do automated tests they 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 have to adapt to whatever language they're used to using because the cognitive overload of trying to learn a new language just to do automated testing for a lot of our customers is is a little more to, than than we really want to ask so we decided what we would do is we would we would open source or we would we would make available a set of page objects um that would allow our customers to using the page object pattern to uh run tests right and run tests against a salesforce application without them having to do all the locating of elements and so on themselves but the problem is if you're writing a page object library how do you write what language do you write it in in such a way that all of your customers can use it so um the way we approached it was because right now we 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 know that our two biggest language developers are java and javascript uh 
Well, if you write our page objects in Java, that's the only language that you can use the page objects in is Java. JavaScript is the same way. So instead, what we did was we created a grammar by which we could declaratively describe the shape of a page object, the shape of its API, and created a pair of compilers that would take that JSON description and generate the source code for the page object itself. So we have one source of truth, which of the definition of the page objects, the UTAM page object description file. And then uh, we run it through these two compilers and get consumable artifacts that contain the consumable artifacts of the page objects for um, Java and JavaScript. We also have the ability or the, the, the possibility of supporting other languages in the future. But those are the two we started for our initial releases. Um, and we have a runtime component that you, to, to use the page objects with. And that's what I've been working on right now. And those, those, those compilers or the Java compiler is open source. It's completely open source. It's available on GitHub. Um, the JavaScript compiler, we are still working through a few details about that. Um, but we have, uh, you know, the, the, the project itself in, in general is open source. We have publicly available page object artifacts. Uh, the, and, and, you know, so that's, that's uh, what I've been working on at Salesforce for the last uh, two or three years now. And, and we're, we're starting to get releases out the door, which is, which is a lot of fun. It's good to see it finally come to fruition. Wonderful, wonderful, Jim. I could totally relate. When I was working for, uh, I mean, in my life, I've been consultant all my life, and I um, had customers who had Salesforce-based app applications. Wish this was open sourced earlier. Uh, I was just looking at it last week, and I was just uh, pasting a link on the chat so that people could, you know, take a look at it um, after the session and know more about UTAM. It's such a wonderful um, thought process, I would say. Um, so, Jim, having said that. How does it really open source and innovation correlate each other? Well, there's a there, there's an old saying um, that that uh, that that I think uh, I, I'm probably going to misattribute the quotation. Um, uh, I think I first encountered it in the Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond. But the 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 the, the, the quote is, or the, the the saying is, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And so, so, you know, with enough people looking at a, a specific bug in a, in a, in a code base, um, the chances are higher with more people looking at it that somebody will figure out how to resolve the issue. Uh, so that's one thing is that, is that, you know, when it's working properly, uh, you know, more software stability can be expected. Uh, additionally, you know, with an open source project or with open source software, uh, if you see a need for a feature in a given library that it doesn't have, uh, you know, you don't have to go to some monolithic corporation and try to convince them that adding this feature to this library would be economically beneficial to them and that they really should do it. You can take the code base and add the feature yourself. Uh, whether or not the owners of that of that uh, library uh, accept your feature into the main repo, you can still maintain your your you know forked version of it with the features that you need. That's 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 really the beauty of open source and how you can get um, uh, sort of innovation and new features. Um, Additionally, you know, it helps when if, if, if there are many other libraries that do kind of the same kinds of thing and they're all open source, uh, you can kind of inspect and see how different approaches to the same problem uh, happen and um, kind of evaluate with an open mind or with, with all of the information available what the pluses and minuses are to any given approach to a problem, uh, a software problem that is. Uh, so those are some some of the ways that I think that open source is really helpful when it comes to creating stable and evolving and advancing software. Wonderful, Jim. Completely resonate with that. Spot on. Um, I think you answered the how part of it. Um, there's slightly related question. I'm going to pick a question from the audience, live audience. Sure. Uh, it has the maximum number of votes, uh, which is slightly related to it, which is talking about more on, um, so you covered the how part, this is more around the uh, where and what part of it. Like what are some of the great platforms to find out open source projects to work on? 
Sure. Um, so, uh, so, so there, there are a number of different options uh, here. Um, you know, I follow people on Twitter a lot. Twitter is, is useful for, for me for this because it gets, you know, in, in my Twitter feed, I get exposed to a lot of different projects that are out there and uh, I, I, I can go, uh, check out the projects at my leisure and, uh, and, 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 and do that. So Twitter is a, is a good place for me, especially, you know, if you follow open source advocates, if you follow, um, uh, people who are in the software industry and software developers of other open source projects, uh, it, it helps you to, to, uh, to, 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 to be exposed to new, new things. Um, I don't do a lot of just browsing of GitHub for, for, oh, for, for projects to, to get into. I don't, I don't really do that. Um, I, I don't know that that would be terribly useful to just start looking around at GitHub, but, um, I do know that, for example, in the Selenium IRC channel, uh, the Selenium IRC channel or, or Slack channel, uh, they, they're mirrored between Slack and, 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 and IRC, um, I will frequently see, see mentions there of open source projects that people are working on or that they, they link to as they want to integrate and looking for the, uh, the, the, you know, the integration points. So a lot of those are, are good places to do, you know, IRC channels or chat rooms where you're talking about one open source project can often cross pollinate into another. Got it. Got it. All right. With that, um, getting into some of the interesting part of the fireside chat that I've been keeping as a surprise element for Jim. So uh -oh. Jim, um, and for the attendees, uh, the way that I'm structuring the conversation is to hear some parts of around Jim's uh, life experience around open source. And we touched upon a little bit on the professional journey. And then we also picked up some questions from the Q&A panel. So now um, I've been knowing Jim for about 10 years now, maybe Jim. Um, <laughs> and the other members of Selenium community. Um, so I have some interesting photos um, that I want to oh, share boy. now uh, to see if you really, you know, recollect those moments and share with oh, us. This could be, this could be dangerous. All right. <laughs> All right. Here we go. This is. All right. I'm going to do it. Yes. Here we go. Ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> oh, this is a fun photo. Okay. Tell us more. So, yeah. so, so, so you, you want the story behind this photo then, I guess. Um, this, so as part of the Selenium project, one of the things that we undertook was uh, originally, or, you know, as, as during my tenure on the project, um, the, the way that, uh, Selenium communicates with the, with its, with the browser, uh, has been governed by a protocol, a wire protocol, uh, in it, JSON over HTTP is how it's, is how it was originally done. And, uh, one of the things that we set out to do was we approached, uh, the, one of the reigning standards bodies, the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C, um, as a, as a way to see if, hey, let's standardize a protocol for test automation of browsers. And um, the way that W3C uh, specs come into being and standards come into being is you get a bunch of people together from the interested parties. And in our case, that would include people from Selenium and people from browser vendors uh, and people from other ancillary, uh, you know, cloud providers of Selenium services and so on. Uh, and you create a working group and that working group produces a specification. Um, that photo was uh, part of being a part of a working group is that from time to time you get together face to face in one location and spend a day or two just hashing stuff out about the spec and getting issues worked out and, and arriving at a consensus. And everything is done in the W3C on a consensus basis. Uh, that particular photo was from one of the earlier face-to-face -face meetings that we had. It was in London, uh, in England, and um, we had finished working for the day, and we were we we decided we were going to go out and find something for dinner, and we ended up walking over uh, to I 
think we ended up walking over to Covent Garden, but I can't remember exactly. Uh, and we found a burger joint, a burger place, and we bought hamburgers and uh, and 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 got them to go and sat down on the curb right here on the side of the street and and had dinner together as a group. And uh, and those are the members of the working group at the that were members of the working group at the time at that. Uh, um, at that face-to-face -face working group meeting. And that was a, that was a great time was had by all. I'm going to put you under the spot. Can you name them, Jim? Uh, <laughs> let's see. I can name most of them. Um, starting at the left, that's Wilhelm, um, uh, who is one of the snappiest dressers I have ever met. Uh, amazingly fantastic guy. Um, that's Luke Inman Simmer, I believe, next to him, who is a colleague of mine at Salesforce nowadays. At the time, I don't believe that he was, but he, mm -hmm. he, he um, uh, or we might have been. I can't remember exactly when this was taken. Uh, next to him is John Jansen, who was at Microsoft at the time. Uh, I think that's Malini Das. And next to her is David Burns, who is currently the working group chair for the working group that still exists. Um, let's see. Malini and David and the gentleman next to him is James uh, Graham who all three of them were at Mozilla at the time. James is still at Mozilla. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, then there's me, and I don't remember who's on the other end there. Um, one of those guys, I think, is a Googler, if I could be, if I may be mistaken. I can't remember who's on the far right. I know that Simon Stewart uh, is not in this photo because he's taking the photo. That's that's why I know that that's why I know that Simon Stewart is not in this photo because he took it. Right. Is that the person who worked on um, Selenium IDE or is it different? Shinya? No, no, no. it's not. Uh, no, it's not. Um, I, I'm struggling to remember who the other two, the other two far, are on the, on the far left, on the far right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, folks who are listening to the talk, sh shall we do one more photo and go into the questions? Yes or no? Okay, there's a lot of yes. All right, Jim, one more to put you on the spot. All right, one more. There we go. Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> is so this, before is Jim, this Jim, Jim, before Jim answers, um, we all know our managers would like to say, "I wanted, I want a rock star developer." How many of you know Jim <laughs> is an actual rock star developer? You know, um, go check out Spotify, and Jim has his own playlist, his own compose composition of songs. Um, Jim can really play very well musical instruments, uh, and whenever yeah. I think, um, I, th I remember StamConf Austin. He was doing a karaoke for the first time, and I was like spellbound. I Did, I was like dumbstruck. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, Jim, that is fantastic!" And Marcus joined you uh, doing the guitar. Um, yeah. All right. That's that's enough from my side. I mean, uh, after I mean, oh, to you. Um, do you remember this so, photo? This looks like this looks like a karaoke photo. What I don't remember is whether this is it's it, it, it it's more than likely a Selenium Conf photo, if I had to guess. Um, I would suspect it's either Chicago or Austin. I don't remember which one because I don't remember which stage had that particular mural in the background. Um, you'll have to refresh my memory, Manoj. I don't remember if that's Chicago or if that's if that's if that's in Austin. Uh, my guess is Austin. Um, by the way, this photo was shared by Simon. I reached out to a couple of them in our Selenium project. Um, Simon shared this. To put put Jim on the spot for this. If photo. that's Austin, if that's Austin, then I can guarantee you that I'm doing the song "Walking in Memphis" by Mark Cohn. <laughs> right. All right. All right. Sounds good. So people are asking one more photo, one more photo, uh, but let's hold on um, to it. We'll come back to we'll, that. Let's yes, come back to that. Yes. Yes. Stop share. Um, all right. So. So Jim, uh, coming back to your open source journey, um, tell us some of your experiences, um, how it has helped you as a human um, and also professionally. Well, uh, professionally to be sure, um, I can start with that. Uh, I have definitely, um, uh, I, I've definitely benefited from Uh, from my work open, in open source professionally um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's given me the opportunity to practice, practice, practice at being a developer. 
And that is one of the, th one of the ways that I personally get better at something. Uh, for me, learning something is learning by doing and learning by, by practicing at it. And so that, that's one way that it has benefited me professionally. Uh, another way is, um, yeah, is also I've been able to network with a bunch of really, really, really smart people over the years uh, who have taught me so much uh, that that um, that I that, that I, I can't even begin to express uh, how much I've learned from other open source developers. Uh, you know, I, I, my my educational background is not in computer science, so I am not a trained computer scientist. Um, uh, what I know about programming, I've learned mostly on the fly. Um, and, and, and that, you know, so, so being able to learn from other people has been a, a really great help. Uh, personally, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, some of those same developers have become among the best friends I have ever had in my life and ever will have. And, and I, you know, I, uh, I said it before, I'm lucky enough to count Minoj as among those friends, um, uh, you know, uh, Thanks, it, I've made some great, some, have made some great relationships, uh, throughout the, throughout the, 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 the course of my tenure at open source. I can say that there, there are some challenges personally when it comes to open source. Um, there's sometimes the feeling that, uh, you don't get to switch off and, 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 and taking, taking a break from doing software development, if that's what you do for a living every day and then to go after hours or whatever if your job doesn't support you doing open source work to do more coding while that can be fun and rewarding it can be a challenge to and, and easy to sometimes to burn out on that uh interpersonally sometimes also people who use open source libraries uh users of open source libraries are great. They're wonderful people and for the most part, but sometimes it can be a challenge for community-based open source projects where the projects are built and maintained entirely by a group of volunteers with no uh, sort of financial compensation or, you know, compensation other than just, uh, uh, just the fact that they're doing something good in the world. Um, Sometimes users don't necessarily uh, take that into account when they go to report issues or complain that an issue hasn't been fixed or, uh, you know, why haven't you done this, that, and the other? Sometimes those interactions can be a little taxing um, uh, because it, 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 most of the time it's just basically due to um, – People not recognizing that, oh, hey, you know, you're doing this just because you volunteer to do it, not because you're, you know, getting paid to do it or part of a job or part of a company that's doing it. So sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge uh, from a personal perspective. Um, but those interactions are usually relatively easy to diffuse. Sure, Jim. Can completely resonate with that. I think um, personally for me, um, I've gained a lot of uh, good friends. Uh, thanks, Jim, for considering me a good friend. I'm, and I'm no for sure um, if I ever walk into US, especially around Tampa area, I can walk into Jim's house. Um, and Jim and Patty can host me uh, there. And Absolutely. likewise, in in, in London, um, Fitz Simon's house. I've already been there. Um, I think he was kind enough to give a nice tea. <laughs> and, and Matilda as well. Uh, cool. Um, thanks, Jim. And uh, moving on... Um, Picking up a question from the Q&A panel. Um, speaking of open source, a question from Tamalika. What are the security checks companies should do before using an open source product? That's a that's a that's a really good question. Um, uh, I'm not necessarily sure um, that I'm fully qualified to answer that question because I'm not a security expert. Um, I do know that, um, that, you know, a lot of the times that one of the, one of the things that you can do is you can do an audit of the source. And if you have the ability to do that, or if your company has the ability to do that, that is certainly one very solid approach. Um, 
at the very least, you can go and check the list of dependencies on whatever the project depends on, um, which, you know, that's one of the ways that you can do things like the whole log for J problem where they had a log for J breach that a lot of things depended on that. You can check to see if, if a, a, a project is, is, um, is using a patched version of something where you knew there was a problem. Um, uh, you can also, for most open source projects, you can also engage with the development team, but uh, and and ask them questions specifically about things like security and 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 uh, and dependencies and things like that. But in my experience, it is far more useful when you're interacting with the development team to say. To, to come with a specific security question as opposed to, hey, what are security vulnerabilities in your in, in your project? Um, the other piece of advice I can give when when you when you interact with development teams, especially when it comes to like security of their code, um, is to recognize that you know developers, particularly those in open source and especially those in volunteer open source projects, um, they're people. At the end of the day, um, not only not only do they make mistakes, but let's be understanding that we all make mistakes and let's be understanding that, um, that you know, berating them for having made a mistake doesn't help. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily, um, uh, doesn't necessarily, uh, foster a sense of community, uh, especially when, if it's all volunteers, somebody can just say, fine, I'm not volunteering for this project anymore. I that's that's the problem with volunteer uh, open source yep. projects is that you know somebody can say I'm I'm tired of getting raked over the coals I you know I'm just not going to spend my precious time and effort on this anymore. Sounds fair. Sounds fair enough. Um, I have a slightly related question to that, but before that, um, I have this question that uh, Jim, you've been there, done that, contributing to open source for all these years. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm someone. Because contributing to open source is not easy. Um, True. If I'm a, if I'm somewhere early in my career, or maybe an experienced experienced programmer, or, mm -hmm. or an architect, test architect, um, contributing to open source is very different because people will look at your code. People may judge you, which is exactly the point that you were just mentioning. Um, mm -hmm. So if if I'm someone new who is looking forward to contribute to open source, but I've been worrying about people judging me around, you know, looking at my code quality, people looking, okay, will people judge my code? Um, what do they think about it being it public? So given you've been there, done that, how have you overcome or how would you let the upcoming um, testers who are looking forward to contribute to open source um, move away from that feeling? That's a really good question. And I'll be honest with you, I still struggle with it sometimes. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I still struggle with it, with the fact that, uh, you know, people are, pe pe and, and when people, you know, criticize the code that I've written, it still can sting. Um, you know, one, for example, I can give you a, a, an example in the, in the Selenium project, uh, in the .NET bindings, for example, um, the .NET bindings don't use the async await pattern in C that's, it's, you know, that's fashionable in C sharp development these days. Um, why the reason why we haven't ever done that is because, well, first of all, the, the, the bindings were written long before those, uh, those, those, the, the, that pattern existed. Um, and second of all, in order to add the async await pattern to the .NET bindings, uh, we would need to either replace the existing API with an async API or create a parallel API, one that's the current one and one that is the async API, and uh, that, that it would essentially double the API surface, which means more maintenance, cost, more effort involved to keep it all uh, straight and keep it all working correctly. So, uh, you know, we've decided to make a trade-off, at least for now, to not support the async await pattern. Um, and every now and again, you'll get, you'll get somebody who says, that's stupid. You don't, why, why are you not doing that? And, you know, it, it, sometimes it helps to be able to articulate the trade-offs that you make when you, you know, in the architecture decisions that you make that somebody who's just looking at the code coming into it blind may not be necessarily aware of. 
uh, that's the kind of thing that, that, that you can do. And I, like I said, I struggle with it sometimes. If somebody says, you know, your code is horrible. That, that's still, that could sting a little bit. Um, one of the things that I could, you, you know, start interacting with people first as people and see if you can find someone to mentor you in a project that you're interested in contributing to that can engage with your code in a constructive way, uh, maybe even privately before submitting directly to a public, a public repo. Uh, a lot of people are really willing to help with that, uh, you know, and really, really friendly and really willing to help. But uh, you just have to actually interact with people directly. You can't just, you know, throw it out there and hope that whoever you happen to get is going to be a kind person. Um, so Absolutely. I, I, that's a good, it's a good question. And, and one that I, I can, I still struggle with even today. Can't believe that Jim. <laughs> you've been, you've been a real pro at it. Um, but you yeah, know, I'm I, just a guy, I just do my thing and, and you know, I'm, I'm still learning. I still learn a lot. I start to learn every day. Uh, Absolutely. you know, I, I learned, I learned to be a better, hopefully today I'm a better developer than I was yesterday. Uh, and hopefully I'm not as good a developer today as I will be tomorrow. Uh, that's, that's, you know, can't it's a continuous put any learning than journey. That. Can't put, thank you. Thank you so much for that. A uh, question from the live audience from Manish. Um, how can QAs contribute to open source apart from being a developer? Can we do testing, logging issues for open source? That's a really good question. So um, testing is great. Testing is fantastic uh, for open source uh, projects because they almost never get enough. Um, and, and, and that's wonderful. And that kind of testing can, can be, can be done, can have mult can take multiple forms. It can take the form of, uh, you know, using the library in your own way and, and make, take, being meticulous about reporting issues. Uh, another way could be contributing test cases into the open source development, uh, project itself. Open source projects rarely have the test coverage that they want. And uh, having new unit tests, integration tests, whatever that the that developers can just use as part or can run as part of the regular development process is fantastic and something that, again, not everybody would be able to do. Um, I would say I would caution, however, that when reporting issues in and that is important, we love getting issue reports. I say we I love getting issue reports, but. It's very, very important that the issue report includes something, some way that I, as a developer, as an open source developer, can simply fire it up and reproduce the issue that that you are reporting right away. Whether that's via a, a, a simple GitHub repo that I can just clone and run the test, or uh, a full set of reproduction steps for uh, for it in the issue report. For a project like Selenium, the tricky bit is that it's not enough to have the code that, that demonstrates the issue. You've also got to have a web page to run the code against. That's the problem we have with Selenium issue reports mostly is that there's not a good way to reproduce them because while people can show us the code that fails, they don't show us a, a website that we can run that code against and see it fail. Absolutely. If I may add one more point, Jim. Contributing to code is not the only option. We have been sharing that in the keynote sessions as well. Uh, sure. You could come simply answer questions. You may be an expert in using Selenium. Maybe you have used it for a couple of years and maybe there are people still getting started with Selenium and they might have questions. Um, so if you are if you love solving those problems, come hang around in the Slack channel. You could answer them. Sure. That counts as a contribution too. You can still be uh, Absolutely. called as a contributor. All right, Jim, for the time. Here we go. Oh my goodness. This, I believe, this looks like Selenium Conference in Tokyo, was it? Was this Tokyo? No. No. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't because Patty was there. This was London. Yes, you're right. That's London. This was London. This was the Where second was London it? conference. Uh, this was, this, I believe, this looks like it was in the green room. Um Let's see. I recognize most of the people in that photo. Do you do um, you uh, do you want a clue? <laughs> re refresh my memory. 
um it's it's one of the person's room in the um in the photo it's their house oh that's right this is oh yes of course <laughs> silly me this is this is this is uh this is simon's place this is this is where we had dinner uh after uh the the uh, Celine london. Conference in, in in london yes Absolutely. yes i that was that was a that was a that was a fun night that was a good time yeah yeah have one more this now is Tokyo. Uh, this was yes. a fun, that, that was a, a, an interesting trip. Uh, that was you and me and Marcus, and we were scouting the location to have to do our first Selenium conference in Tokyo to see if it was a viable uh, location. And uh, uh, I think we, uh, we, we, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that time. Uh, and I think we got some good work done there on that, on that trip, eventually leading to our first uh, 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 Selenium conference in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good, Jim. That's enough for photos. Um, I think we are slightly on time as well. Um, I have a question that I wanted to ask. So you've been there around 10 plus years in Selenium and mm -hmm. there's a lot of recent improvements that's been happening in Selenium, Jim, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. especially around WebDriver Baidai that's coming through. And I know you've been an active participant in TW3C mm -hmm. meetings as well as TPAC uh, that we mm -hmm. were just discussing um, just before the session was live. Um, where do you see Selenium going from here to say fast forward for you four to five years? How does, will Baidai will have an impact or sure. in general, yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things, and one of the real strengths that the Selenium project is, has, and continues to have, and has always had, uh, is the fact that uh, it's based on uh, on web standard technologies, uh, and and that means that a lot of the heavy lifting for how Selenium does things with browsers is actually written into the browser itself. It's written by the browser vendors. They do the heavy lifting of that. They know the browser better than anybody. They know it better than we do because they built the browser. So they know how to automate it better than anybody. We, as the, we, the Selenium project, provide a, you know, a nice way to, 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 to interface with that mechanism for, for talking to the browser or for, for driving the browser. Um, Recently, there has been there you know, the last few years there have been uh, there has been some proliferation of other test automation projects that uh, are not tied to the WebDriver protocol. Uh, they are tied to something that's more proprietary or in some other way. A lot of them, or some of them that I've noticed, use, for example, the Chrome debug uh, the DevTools protocol. Um, one of the things that they tout as one of their their uh, advantages over Selenium is that they have uh, they they not only do they support send a command and get a response, which is how Selenium does its how WebDriver is designed, but you can also say subscribe me to an event, and when this event happens on the browser side, send me a notification of that event so that so that simplifies so rather than polling for a for for a condition, you can get notified when a condition happens. Um, CDP, the Chrome DevTools protocol, supports that, even though it's not designed to be a test automation protocol. It's designed to be a, a developer tools protocol. Um, so one of the things after we completed the work on the web driver specification, we said, well, you know, yeah, we can understand why that type of approach is popular. What can we do? Is there something we can do to help make that, to help bring that to a standardized mechanism. And so we've been working on a, a new version of the WebDriver spec, which we call WebDriver BiDi uh, for bidirectional, which, uh, which supports both the command and response and as well as uh, subscribing to events and having events pushed to the, to, to the client side. And uh, going forward, I think you'll see, uh, uh, you'll see Selenium adopt that that bi-directional protocol as its primary mechanism for communicating with a browser. Again, remaining with the fact that it's going to be uh, remaining, you know, remaining in the standardization realm where we're using standards uh, that, are, that are web standards as opposed to proprietary technology. Parallel to that, um, I think you'll also see a move in Selenium to help it evolve 
into more of a batteries included kind of approach. Right now, previously the 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 um, the, uh, the 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 approach of the of the of the browser or the approach of the project was do a, be a small project, do one thing, do it well, drive a browser. Turns out that a lot of people want more than that. They want they want to have uh, they want assertions. They want uh, to not have to manage their own browser manage uh, browser driver. Uh, so we want to be able to download those automatically and so on and so on. So I think you'll see Selenium possibly evolve to have some of those other uh, features that you might find in one of the more one of the more recently created um, uh, automation frameworks. Sounds good. Sounds good. I mean, last question that I really should ask, um, Jim, you've been on onboarded on a time mission. Rewind, rewind back to ten years, and if you were to change okay. something in Selenium project, what that would be? If I had to change something in the Selenium project, what would that be? Um. Gosh, uh, I probably would have the, the, the changes would there would not have been many changes that I would have made. Um, I would have probably changed our JavaScript story a little bit um, and promoted it and gotten it uh, more robust and more accepted when it was first introduced than it was. Um uh, when it came to JavaScript language bindings, we, we, we kind of, the Selenium project fell behind quite a bit um, for various reasons. Um, so that's one thing I might change, might have changed. Um, I probably would have taken some slightly different approaches with the IE driver than I took. Um, but I can't complain about how that all worked out in the end. Got it. Got it. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, it's really overshoot by two minutes or so. Uh, thank you so much for patiently answering uh, all our questions. And I hope really uh, people listening to this talk, we had a good balance between understanding Jim's open source journey and also reliving some of the moments uh, that Jim had has been over the past decade or so um, uh, in the open source world, as well as some insights on, you know, how should you perceive open source? And if you're considering um, contributing to it. I mean, don't overthink about it. Just step forward. And as Jim rightly said, we are people too. So uh, have a people-people interaction first and everything will fall in the place. Right, Jim? I, I, I concur with that. I think that, that uh, you, you you got to approach developers as people. Um, that is one thing that I learned when uh, first approaching open source developers, like, for example, Simon Stewart, who I was very intimidated by originally. Um <laughs> But, uh, but, but that's, that's, uh, that, you know, it, it turns out had no reason to be, he's a very, very friendly chap and I try to be friendly too. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's, that's, um, come, come, to, come, come talk to us, come talk to us as people and we'll interact. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jim. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's just quite an insightful session. And, and as usual, all the talks are recorded and it will be uploaded onto our YouTube. And um, if this is of an interest to you, um, I'm sure Jim would be very happy to do a sort of an AMA style session with us uh, sometime in the future. Um, Absolutely. If, if you're interested, so put it on the chat if, you're, if you would like to have such session in the future. Uh, with that, signing off, Manoj and Jim. See you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.